the cost yet. All right? I'm teasing. All right? Job. I want you to turn to the book of Job. We've been in Joshua now for several weeks. We're going to take a little reprieve from the book of Joshua and go to the book of Job, chapter number one, trying to obey the Lord. I studied out of the book of Joshua most of the day, studied there yesterday, and I've been reading it for several days now. Late this afternoon, probably around 2 or 2.30, the Lord took me away from the book of Joshua and began to stir in my heart a message, a new message out of the book of Job, and I trust it will be a help to us. We need the Lord's help. We need His touch. And uh, Sunday I preached just simply out of a great desire to be your pastor and to warn you some things, try to encourage you in some things uh, as far as the, the day in which we're living. We are living in rough times. We're living in perilous times. Uh, I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and I'll not tell you who he is because you may disagree with him, so I'm not going to bring his name up. But he brought a, a good point up. I have recently preached, and, and I do believe here, uh, that we are living in the Laodicean church age. If you read the book of Revelation there, you see description of the days just prior to the Lord's coming, and uh, they're very fitting to the time that we're living. But guess what? We're in America. The Bible is not centered around America. The Bible is generally centered around Israel and centered around the Middle East. And in many areas in the Middle East, they're experiencing great revival right now. Egypt, thousands are being saved every day. In many other countries around the world, thousands are being saved every day. Brother Braswell is here with us tonight. The, uh, the work in Latin America is just phenomenal. It's amazing what the Lord's doing. Thousands upon thousands. I may mention Sunday, in the 13 years that IBOM has been planting churches in Mexico, over 750,000 people have been saved in those IBOM churches. 62 churches now. That's, that's a lot of people saved. I bless the Lord for that. That's not happening here in America, but it is happening in many other places in the world, which leads us to believe, although we may be showing the Laodicean church age, some other areas of the world are not necessarily showing that particular time frame. So I'm not, I'm not saying one thing or that. What, I, what I'm trying to say is this. We've been really talking a lot lately of we don't know how bad it's going to get. But if worldwide there has to be the dropping off spiritually that there is in America, if that has to take place worldwide, it could get real bad here. Amen. Don't let that scare you. The grace of God will sustain His people regardless of the times, regardless of what's going on in the world. That is not to scare anybody. That's not to discourage anybody. It's to tell us this, this idea of sitting around till Jesus comes because His coming is right around the corner is really not an option. I believe His coming is right around the corner. But God's corners are a lot bigger than my corners are. And that corner could be a, a much larger time frame than I expected to be. I believe He could come today. I believe before the clock rolls around to midnight tonight, the Lord could very well come again. And I'm excited about that. That leaves a great deal of, of excitement in my soul. The Lord is coming. And church, when He comes, I'm gone. I trust you'll be with me when the Lord raptures the church out. But I know this, don't look for me. If suddenly thousands disappear, millions disappear, and you turn on the news and there's chaos all over the world, don't come down here looking for me. Don't go up to 493 Edmondson Drive looking for me. I'm not going to be there. I promise you this. I went with them. Hey. Amen. I'm sure of that. I know that I'm going in the rapture. All I'm saying is this. It may be that we endure some perilous times. More perilous than the days we're living in now. It could be that we could see some terrible things before the Lord raptures the church out. If that is the case, I sure would like to know the Lord has put a hedge around me. Wouldn't it be good to know that the Lord has put a hedge around you? Job chapter number 1, if you found your place, I want you to stand with me. And I want you to pray that God will help us tonight. I want to be sensitive. I want to preach what God's put on my heart. 
And I want to preach it right. So you pray that God will help us tonight. Verse number one, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I want you to remember verse number one. We're going to come back there in the close of the message. The Bible said, And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred she asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually." Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Listen to verse number 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not, uh, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, you know my heart. You know I have a strong desire tonight to be a help to your people. Lord, I ask you that you would please guard my lips. Help me to say every word I ought to say. Lord, please keep me from saying a single word I should not say. I ask you, Lord, that you would preach a message to every heart. Everyone that's gathered here. Lord, no doubt in this message, the emphasis is going to be on the saints of God. Lord, I pray, though, that you would touch. There may be those in the congregation tonight that do not know you as their Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts through your word. There's power in your word. You've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise and to draw sinners to repentance. I pray, Lord, that you would save sinners tonight. I ask you that you would encourage and strengthen and help the people of God. Lord, would you do a deep work in us a work that would change us forever, a work that would better prepare us for the days of head. And Lord, we will be careful to praise you and to thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, not really a long reading tonight, just 12 verses there. Felt necessary to try to read those in order to uh, bring about the message I feel God wants. We in America have a great need for protection. We in America have a great need for safety. It's in the forefront of everything that we do. We have several folks here tonight that are involved in law enforcement in some way, shape, or form. You would be able to testify to the fact that there is a big push of safety uh, in America today, whether it be through car seats and for children or booster seats for uh, teenagers. Hey Amen. Now I'm teasing about that just a little bit. I remember uh, the booster seat just seems like the age keeps getting higher. And, and all of that. And I know there's safety concerns with that. So uh, the booster seats and the seat belt laws and all of those things, airbags are in all of the cars now. You go and, and, and buy a new car, it's got airbags in the front. I remember the day when, uh, in fact, this was when uh, uh, Papa was alive, Brother Robert's dad, Charlie. A lot of you knew Brother Charlie. And uh, they had just bought that Lum Is it Illumina that she's got? They just bought that Lumina, and, and uh, I was sitting in it one day, and I was checking it out, and and uh, I said, I, <laughs> "Y'all are gonna laugh," and somebody may throw something at me. I'm telling you what he said. Though I, I sat down in the car, I said, "Man, this is nice." I said, "It's even got uh, it's got dual airbags." He said, "Yeah, our old car had that." I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah, one in the steering wheel, one in the passenger seat." 
And uh, that was Robert. He was just teasing, of course, and we were joking around about him. Uh, but uh, most of the cars you buy now, they've got airbags in the front. They've got airbag curtains that roll down now. They've got crash zones and all this. Why are they doing all that? Because they have a strong desire for safety. Everybody wants to know they're safe. You go to, many of you will go home tonight. When you go home, you'll walk in the door and you'll punch a code beside the door there to turn off the alarm. And then when you go to bed tonight, many of you will set that alarm again to make sure nobody comes in in the night. And, and all of that's well and good. I'm not preaching for it. I'm not preaching against it. I'm not telling you if I have one. I'm not telling you if I don't have one. Amen. I'm just simply saying that is driven from a desire of us to be safe. We want to feel protected. We want to feel safe. I wonder if we were to spend as much time safeguarding our spiritual condition as we do safeguarding our physical condition. I wonder what kind of Christians we would become if we spent that much detail and that much attention to making sure we safeguarded our spiritual condition. Sigmund Freud said this, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need of a father's protection. And that's true. As a child, there was just certain things. I remember the first experience I ever had of something breaking at my house and my dad not being able to come fix it. I had a water leak, and I, I could fix water leaks. That wasn't a big deal. I, I know the general things of plumbing. Uh, water goes through the pipe, and if there's a hole there, water comes out of the pipe, so therefore the hole in the pipe must be fixed. You know, anybody want to hire me to be a plumber? The next time you need some help, I'll be glad to come over. i got it figured out. Daddy taught me a long time ago, son, the main thing you need to know about plumbing is water does not run uphill unless it's got pressure behind it. Amen. You, you know that? You can be a plumber. Well, it doesn't take much, does it? But I remember out in Montana on a cold winter's day out there, it dropped down to about 150 below zero, I think it was. Not really. I do believe it was 30 below zero that morning. And uh, we woke up and we couldn't get the water to run. All the water was frozen. When it finally did thaw out, you could hear water spewing uh, up under the house. And I crawled up under there. And I remember laying on my back. And, and I don't even know if I ever told Mandy about this. But I remember laying on my back and squalling, Brother David, like a baby. I mean crying like a baby. Because my dad was 2,000 miles away and I had a leaking plumbing pipe. That's real manly, isn't it? I'm talking about I was raised in the family, I had two kids, wife, and, and here I am laying on my back crying like a baby because my dad's not there to fix a leak in my plumbing. And I know there are bigger things in the world, but it was the first time it hit me, daddy wasn't there. And as growing up, daddy was there. That's what I needed. And that's, I think in childhood, everybody needs to know that. Sometimes they just need to know mama's there for those bumps and the bruises that, that, that daddy just can't fix. Daddy says, what in the world are you crying about? Mama cuddles you up and everything's fine. Uh, there's a need in our lives for protection. As we look at Job's life, we see that uh, verse number 10 describes what God had done for Job. God had put a hedge about Job. And we want to mention several things about this hedge. And I want to preach tonight on this subject, making a hedge. I want to know if the times are going to get as bad as they could get. If we are generally or if we are literally going to live in days that are worse than today. I want to know that God can build and has built a hedge about me. I want to know that I am within a protective barrier of the Lord. You say, why do you want to know that? Because I know He is the greatest of all. I know he, that there is no one else that has greater power than He has. I want to know, I, I know that there is no one uh, that is able to penetrate His power. So therefore, if I am kept within his hedge, nothing can get to me. Let us mention about five things tonight as quickly as I can to try to bring us back to this, give you something to think about, and hopefully something to pray about. Number one, I want to bring your attention to the saints' accessibility. Are all saints hedged about? 
Number one, the obvious thing, we believe in eternal security. We believe that once a person is saved, they are always saved. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, if you genuinely came in repentance and faith in Christ, then you are saved. Your name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are forever His child. You are a son of God. You are placed in His hand. No man can pluck you out. The Bible said He gives them eternal life and they shall never perish. We believe in eternal eternal security. I'm not speaking in regards to the soul. I'm not speaking in regards to our salvation. We know that. That is stated in the Word of God. Everyone who is born again is a child of God and they can never be unborn. We are the saints of God. If you're saved tonight, you're saved eternally. Thank God for that. Aren't you glad for eternal salvation? However, Scripture, I believe, bears out that not all followers of Christ, not all righteous people in the sense of righteousness from God are hedged about from circumstances that come in their life. If we go to the most obvious, we go to a man by the name of Lot. We know that he traveled with Abraham. We know that as long as he was with Abraham, Abraham's blessing was upon Lot. And even when Lot left Abraham, there was a blessing on Lot until Lot went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible does tell us very plainly that Lot was a righteous man. 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, and delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man, talking about Lot, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was called by the Bible, number one, a just man. He was called a righteous man, and he was said to have had a righteous soul. Yet Lot lived in an unrighteous place. He lived in the midst of wickedness. He raised his family in the midst of wickedness and they did not have a hedge to protect him from the wickedness around. That is evident in the fact when he went to gather up his sons-in-laws, he went to gather up his family and head out, they would not go in. They laughed him to scorn. Why? If, if he had had the hedge that Job had, and we'll get into that in just a moment, if he had had the hedge that Job had, then all of his household would have been in that hedge as the Word of God says, Job's household was in the hedge. Lot's household was not hedged about in that way because Lot had turned his back on God. He would went down to live in wickedness. So follow with me here as we go through this. We see Lot was unhedged. His family was unhedged. His surroundings was unhedged. He lost everything that he had. His home burned up. His, his, if he had any land, it burned up. All of his belongings burned up. All he had was him and his daughters. His wife was with him. She to look back and turn into a pillar of salt. And now Lot is just him and his daughters. Everything else is gone. Now would that have happened if Lot had the same hedge that Job had? Because the Bible said Job's household and his belongings, everything that pertained to Job, was in the hedge. We'll get to that in just a moment. What about David? David is called in the Bible a man after God's own heart. You don't get any more beloved than David was. You study the life of David. You study, you will see that David was a man with the evident blessing of God, a man after God's own heart, a man that did great things for God, but yet there were areas in David's life when he turned away from God that the heads came down and the enemy came in and great damage came to David's life. What about David when he is weeping and crying over the loss of a child? What about David when he's weeping and crying over the loss of an adult child? Not only an infant child, but an adult child. What about David when his friends have departed? What about David when the world is crashing in? If he had had the heads that Job had, could any of that have happened because everything that pertained to Job was in the hedge? So I said all that to say this, it is possible for the saints of God not to have a hedge about them. 
It's possible for us to be in a condition where we are open and vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Job was not open and he was not vulnerable to the attack of the enemy until permission was gained. David, the Bible does not say that Satan ever asked permission to touch David's life. And the Bible does not say that Satan ever asked permission to touch Lot's life. But yet Lot was a righteous man. David was a man after God's own heart. So there must be an accessibility to the saints of God if we are not in a certain place for God to hedge us about, then we can be accessed by the enemy and great damage can come. So we see the saints' accessibility. Secondly tonight, I want you to see Satan's assumption. Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Now I will give him credit in this. He does know a lot. He knows more scripture than anybody else in this room. Amen. Many times he quoted scripture. He used scripture. Satan is not scared of the Bible. He's scared of God's people using the Bible. But if he were scared of the Bible, he'd never quote it. But yet he quoted it. Satan knows the Word of God. Satan knows the promises to God's people. That's why he tries to make sure we don't ever tap into those promises. Satan knows the judgment that is coming upon him. That's why he is fighting like a wounded cat. Nothing fights like a wounded cat fights. So I spy the way he is. He knows that the end is coming. He knows the promises that come, the judgment that will come upon him. He's not ignorant to those things. So he does know a lot, but he doesn't know everything. God, in his view of Job, can look down and see the hedge, the barrier that he has put around Job. Job can't even see the barrier. It is an invisible fence that God has put Job within. And all of Job's belonging and all of Job's possession, all of Job's family, everything that pertains to Job is put within this fence. It's invisible. God knows where it's at. Job doesn't even know where it's at. And Satan does not know where the hedge is. Listen to the wording in verse number 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Satan apparently, and I believe the scripture will bear it out, though not stated specifically here, Satan has tried to approach Job before. Why do you believe that? Does not the Bible say, all that live godly shall suffer what? Persecution. Bible tells us verse number one, he is a perfect man, he's an upright man, he's a man that feared God, he's a man that eschewed evil. Satan's tactics have never changed. Satan's attitude toward righteousness has never changed. Satan's attitude toward the people of God has never changed. So if all that live godly shall suffer persecution, Job is one of the godliest men that is living, one that has caught the attention of God and the attention of Satan. Do you not believe Satan's already been after him? Now we know Satan's been about his normal business. What's the Bible say in verse number 7? And the Lord said, Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Do you think he was just on a tour? No, he's the prince and power of the air. You think he was just sightseeing? He's been on vacation, walking up and down and to and fro in the earth? No, he's been in the earth doing what Satan does. He's been disturbing men. He's been persecuting those that would those that look to God. He's been he's been doing all sorts of evil and and committing and compelling men to do all sorts of evil. That's just what he does. Surely by this time he's come against Job at some time or another. But he notices something about Job. No matter what he does, no matter how he tries, he just can't get to him. Satan is not omniscient. He cannot see the hedge. But he forms this opinion, he makes this assumption, God must have a hedge about Job. He's not open like these other men. This man, he seems to be alright. He, he says he believes in God. He says that he believes that God is Jehovah and he believes that God is the creator of all things. But I can access his life. I can get into his life. But Job, there's just something about Job. I can't seem to get to Job. So it comes to this assumption Lord, you put a hedge about Job. Satan is on the prowl. He's attacking all that live godly. And he figures out, I just can't get to him. 
So we've seen the saints' accessibility. We've seen Satan's assumption. Now, thirdly, I want you to see the secure areas that God has placed in Job's life. Notice verse number 10 again. I promise you I'm going somewhere. If you'll just follow along with us for a little bit, I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat in just a few minutes. All right? Isn't that encouraging? That's what she was waiting to hear, wasn't it? So you just follow along for a while. Verse number 10, Hast not thou made an hedge about him, number one, secure area, himself? He said, Job is off limits. You can't touch him. Not only has thou put a hedge about him and about his house. He said, his self is a secure area. His household is a secure area. That means his children. That means his wife. You know, nothing happens to Job's entire estate until permission is granted by the Lord. This hedge is working. This hedge is impenetrable. This hedge cannot be accessed by Satan. Hey, I'll just throw this in there. It really doesn't go in this part of the message, but i got to say it right now. If we are to face real perilous times, I'm talking about if we are to face a time when the saints of God in America are going to suffer great persecution, I want to know that God has has a hedge about me that Satan cannot get through. That's what I want. So you see, not only himself, but his household could not be touched. And then we see in verse number 10 again, and about all that he hath on every side. Himself was a secure area, his household, and then all of his holdings. Everything that pertained to Job was off limits. All of his cattle, all of his sheep, all of his oxen, all of his, uh, all of his herds of any kind, all of his riches, all of his wealth, all of his land, all of his, everything was off limits to Satan because God had put a hedge about Job. If we're going to face some real rough times, I want to know there's some secure areas in my life. And I would be satisfied, Brother Carl... If I just had those three secure areas. If I knew that there was a hedge about me so that Satan couldn't get to me, I'd be a blessing. If I knew that there was a hedge about my household that Satan couldn't get to my wife and my children, I would shout the victory and say hallelujah. If I knew that Satan could not get to any of my assets, nothing that I have, nothing that pertains to me, don't you think for a moment that I would not rejoice greatly and throw my hands in the air and say, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name, if I just had those three secure areas in my life. You could break them down and make many different areas out of that, but those pretty well cover it. Notice this about these secure areas. It was a complete hedge. There were no gaps in it. There were no breaks in it. It was a complete hedge. It was a comforting hedge. Job does not seem to be fretted by this time by anything that's going on. Job doesn't seem to be worried about the things that are going on around him. Doesn't seem to be worried about his cattle. Doesn't seem to be worried about his children. Although he wants them to be right, he wants to make sure they haven't offended God. So therefore, uh, he does sacrifices for them and he prays continually that his children would stay right. That's a blessing, and that was not... Let me, let me throw this in there, just a nugget for you to chew on. Parents, this will help you. Grandparents, it will help you too. I do not believe that Job was concerned with his children's spirituality so that he wouldn't look bad. There's a lot of parents raising children for one purpose, so they don't look bad. There's a lot of grandparents praying for their grandchildren for one purpose. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be ashamed. I do not believe that is the motivation behind Job. Job says this. He did not say, uh, let's go back to verse number 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were going about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and embarrassed me. You read that? That's not there. It may be that my sons have sinned and brought shame on the family. Doesn't say that. Says it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. 
Job was not, he wasn't concerned with any outward appearance. He wasn't concerned with any outward sin. He wasn't concerned with anything that a neighbor could view. He was concerned with what the God of heaven would see in the hearts of his children. So Job was raising children not for the neighbors and not for the brethren, but Job was rearing children for the glory of God. I think preachers, I think Christians would do a lot better if we'd raise our children for the glory of God. Not for the glory of the brethren. And not for the glory of sister so-and-so that's going to tell everybody how bad your kids are. Amen. Well, that was just a nugget. You can take it or, or leave it. Like I told you the other day, if it's a nugget, treasure. If it's a pebble, throw it at somebody. Amen. Either way works fine with me. It's a, com it a comforting hedge. Job is not worried about it. It's a complete hedge. It's a consuming hedge. Up to this point, Job had a hedge about him and Every time Satan would come at it, whatever, whatever attack Satan brought was just absorbed in the hedge. Never did get to Job. If we're going to face some real bad times, I sure would like to know I've got a hedge like that about me and about my household and about all of my holdings. Number four, we've seen the secure areas. We've seen uh, the saints' accessibility. We've seen Satan's assumption. Notice with me now quickly the sovereign advancement. Notice the rest of verse number 10. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Two things here. We're going to get to our last point. Number one, he blessed his labor. God bless his labor. And I'll throw this out there. God blesses labor. God bless his labor. That's what God does. He's given us an ability. Even, even God in His perfect creation, His perfect environment, what did He tell Adam to do? Dress and keep the garden. Adam, I've given you a perfect environment. You don't have to worry about anything. Every need you ever have is met. I've given it to you. All I want you to do is dress and keep the garden. He said, Adam, I've given you everything, but you're still going to have to labor. And really, it wasn't even a labor. It was more just a service. God blesses labor. That's what he said. Uh, Satan said this about uh, Job. He said, God, you bless all that he does. You bless his work. You bless his labor. How in the world am I supposed to do something when you bless, such a, bless a man with such abundance in his labor? And then secondly, not only did he bless his labor, he blessed his luxury. He said there in the latter part of verse number 10, and his substance is increased in the land. He said, you bless the work of his hands and it just seems like his substance just keeps increasing. Increasing, increasing. By the way, increasing here is not meant by, by a little bit. It doesn't mean to have something add, added to it. It means to be multiplied. He's increased his substance. Aren't you glad the Lord not only meets the direct needs and the necessities of life, but I'm glad He does meet the desires of the heart, aren't you? In fact, I believe that if we only desired the right things, He'd meet every desire. Amen. Now, some of you are going back in your mind, I remember, I remember a desire I had that God didn't meet. I'll throw two things at you. One, your heart was not in condition where it needed to be for you to desire the right things. One. Secondly, your desire, because of that condition, would have been detrimental to you. And God loves you too much to give you things that will hurt you. Amen. You stick rat poison out there and make it look enticing, paint it red and blue, make it look like candy. But I love, my, and my children may want it, but Brother Carl, I love them too much to give it to them. They may really desire. There's a lot of things my kids want. There's a lot of things I want. God loves me too much to give me because He knows how bad they would hurt me. So we see the sovereign advancement. We've seen the secure areas. Get ready, the baseball bat's coming, okay? We've seen the, uh, the saints' accessibility. Not all, not all saints are hedged about like this. Now we come to the last one, the spiritual application. Go back with me to verse number 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Why did Job have a 
hedge about him that was impenetrable? Why did Job have a hedge about him that Satan could not get through? Why did Job have a hedge about him that protected himself and protected his entire household and protected all of his holdings? What was the key? Job had given God some materials to build a hedge about. Job said, God, I'm going to be perfect. And we know that does not mean to be sinless. It does not mean to have you no know, imperfections. There was no man ever besides Christ Himself who had no imperfections. What the word perfect means, He was mature. He was complete. He was clean. In fact, I'll give you the direct definition. It means to be perfect, complete. It means pious. It means moral. It means to be gentle, to be dear, to be coupled together be undefiled. That was Job. God said, you know what? I can build a hedge out of that. That's a perfect man. And he's giving me something to work with. I can build a hedge out of that. But it wasn't enough just to be perfect. Notice there was, there was another material that was used here. He was perfect and upright. Word upright, according to definition, means to be straight. Means to be just means to be well pleasing or just simply to be righteous. Job was a perfect, a complete, an entire man. He was a righteous, holy, straight man. Job had given God some things to build a hedge out of. Not only was he perfect and upright, the Bible said in verse number one again, and one that feared God. Be perfectly honest with you, in the day that we're living right now, there are very few people that fear God. You understand what fear is? It, it, fear, fearing God does not mean you're scared of Him. Fear of God simply means a holy reverence for who He is and the power that He has. I trust that my children fear me. But Brother Troy, I'd be devastated to find out they were scared of me. I want my children to know when I say something, I have the authority and the power to back it up. And I trust that they reverence and respect me enough to submit to that, to, to give their lives to, to my authority because they fear me. But if I ever were to find out, Brother Eric, that they were scared of me, I'd break my heart. God's not interested in you cowering down and hiding from Him. Adam hid from God in irreverent fear. But Brother Davin, Adam fellowshiped with God in reverent fear. You mark it down. You're, you can tell a lot about how your fear is with God, whether it's a reverent fear or irreverent fear as to whether or not you're open to Him or hiding from Him. The moment you begin hiding from Him, you've got the wrong kind of fear toward God. Even when you know condemnation would come, even when you know chastening would come, there ought to be something in your heart that says, God, I fear You enough to come to You. Fear, reverent respect. He feared God. God said, I can build a hedge out of that. Number four, He said He eschewed evil means to turn off, call back, to depart from, to be grieved by, to pluck away, to put away, to rebel from. When's the last time you rebelled from evil? We think rebellion is a bad thing. If you're rebelling against evil, it's no longer bad. Problem is, most rebellion is rebellion against God, rebellion against good, not rebellion against evil. When was the last time you bowed up because somebody was wicked? Amen. He has shoot evil. And God looked down and said, Job has got some characteristics that I can build a hedge out of. Here's the problem Lot didn't have the hedge Job had. He didn't give God any materials to build one with. Here's the problem with David when David was so open to and, and vulnerable to the attacks. He didn't give God any material to build a hedge with. 
So I'm just simply asking you this. What kind of material have you given God to build a hedge up in your life? You see, some of us, we've given God about enough material to put up a little knee wall around us. Well, that works fine as long as chihuahuas is the only thing coming. I'm not real worried about ankle biters anyway. I was over there at Brother Tommy's today. They got one of them little things. Right? I, honestly, I ate more than that for breakfast. <laughs> a little bit of chihuahua, cute little dog. He'd come barking. I mean, it had in its mind that it was 300 pounds and I was three. Now, in reality, it was three pounds. I was 300 pounds. But in his mind, he didn't think so. That thing come out. <laughs> he's ready to tear me up. D didn't bother me a bit. Amen. My shoe is literally bigger than that dog. It was, hey man, I would never do this, Miss Brenda, but you do know that I would cover its entire body if I ever wanted to. But I never would. I'm not worried about the ankle biters. Problem with many Christians is we're only spiritual enough to keep the devil's ankle biters away from us. And that works fine for a little while, but eventually... It's not going to be the chihuahuas that he's sending. He's going to unleash the real hounds of hell. And when the real hounds of hell come after you, you better have a hedge built up. And you better have given God some material to build something out of. Some tonight feel that you're wide open to everything. Everything's just pounding you, beating at you crumbling around you. Just offer this question. What have you given God to build a hedge about? Well, this is something personally God's been doing in my life for, for days and weeks and months. Taking Scripture, I was talking to uh, the same preacher today, talked to him for quite some time. I told him, I said, Preacher, I'm having trouble living, and I mentioned it Sunday, I'm having trouble living with one chapter of the Bible. Colossians chapter 3. Brother Troy, I'm still struggling with it. It's been another half a week since Sunday when I preached about it. But I pulled the card out again today, Brother Dad, and I began to look at the list of things to mortify and the things to put off and the things to put on. And I said, my goodness, I don't know if I'll ever conquer this one chapter. And what are there? Is it 1,100 and... 79 or 1700 and something. Somebody know right off the top how many chapters in the Bible? How many? 1189. I was real close, wasn't I? 1189 chapters and I'm struggling getting one of them. Amen. So this is personal for me. I want to know when the enemy comes. I want to know when times get real bad that I've given God enough material to build a hedge up. That the enemy can't get in. I do not want to be so selfish as to only give him enough material to build a hedge about me and leave my family open to the attacks of Satan. God forbid. Brother Troy, I don't even want to be to the place where I'd have enough material to protect me and my wife and kids, but then everything else that I love and everything else that... Because guess what? This church falls within my holdings. Please don't take that and run with it. I, didn't, I did not just say I own the church. But this church is my ministry. God forbid that I ask God to build a hedge about me and then just include my family and leave all of God's people open and accessible to Satan's attacks. I want to give God some material. What have you given God to build a hedge up in your life? So we stand on our feet, every head bowed, every eye closed.